We'll uh, take our first break here. This is a great opportunity to go network at the trade show. Go take a look at uh, what's happening over at the trade show. This is sponsored by Helium Evolution and Elanco Animal Health. And uh, we're going to reconvene in about 20 minutes. In 20 minutes' time, we're going to reconvene for another remote presentation. So that's going to be coming up around 10.30. In the meantime, I want to say a, a great big thank you to our sponsors for making this all possible. The heritage sponsors include Farm Credit Canada, JGL, Real Agriculture, Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, Western Litho Printers, and the Western Producer. We'll be back in 20 minutes. Coming up in just a little bit, our break today, sponsored by Helium Evolution and Elenco Animal Health. And we hope you're able to take advantage of the trade show. There'll be more opportunities for that coming up in just a moment. A great big thank you to our gold sponsors here today, Golden West Radio, Grain Millers Canada Corporation, Saskatchewan Livestock Finance Corpor Cooperative, Saskatchewan Stock Growers Foundation, Sweet Pro Canada, Titan Livestock, Vitiquinol Canada, Young's Equipment and Zoetis. For our next session, if you can find your seats now, our next session, we've got Tyler Fulton with us, Vice President of the Canadian Cattle Association. He's going to give an update on the activities of the CCA. Now, Tyler was elected Vice President of CCA on March 24th, 2023. He serves as past president of Manitoba Beef Producers. He was first elected to the CCA back in March of 2020 and has served as an active member of the Domestic Agriculture Policy and Regulations Committee and Foreign Trade Committee. Last year, he was named Chair of the Domestic Agriculture Policy and Regulations Committee and previously served CCA in the capacity of Officer at Large. Folks, if we could just get your attention here, we're going to keep on going here. Fulton and his wife, Dorell along with their kids, Evan and May, own and operate Titan Farm Limited, a 600-head cow-calf operation south of Bertle, Manitoba. They are a third-generation cattle-producing farm family with parents David and Verna Fulton still active on the farm. The farm consists of 6,000 acres in prairie pothole country. We call that Regina. With most of it being pasture and the remaining cultivated land used for hay, corn, and other feed production. The commercial cow herd is predominantly a mix of Angus, Galve, and Simmental breeds with the calving season in mid April to May time frame. I hope I didn't give away your entire presentation. If not, Tyler Fulton, everybody, Tyler Fulton. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tyler. There was a lot there. I don't remember submitting that, so, anyways, it was all accurate. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's uh, it's a it's a pleasure to uh, to to bring uh, the update from the Canadian Cattle Association. But I, I feel like I need to manage expectations a little bit. Um, I've not made this presentation before, and uh, and I actually just got some of these slides yesterday. Um, and what Ryder Lee told me is is just make it my own. So. So I did. I, I put pictures into it. Uh, that's what I. <laughs> that's what made it my own. So what it, my intention is to uh, to roll through them pretty quickly. I'll I'll, I'll touch on some key points that um, that I want to you know focus on a little bit more. Um, but hopefully the the plan will be to leave lots of time for questions. Um, much prefer some back and forth. Get some feedback from from you guys to. To see which you know the direction that that you all would like to see uh, the industry go, and uh, so with that, I'll 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 just get started. Okay. So um, as you all know, there's uh, there's a checkoff, and uh, CCA uh, receives its funds from all of the provi uh, provincial uh, cattle organizations, actually SCA here in in uh, Saskatchewan, and the, the uh, funding uh, amounts to about 53 cents per head. And that works out uh, when, you, uh, when you work out all of the marketings across the country, it works out to about a $3.7 million budget. Um, and really, our goal here is to, is to be present, um, is to show up uh, and represent the cattle industry um, you know, predominantly in Ottawa, but across the country, 
um, to make sure that um, that our our uh, opinions and that our uh, perspectives are reflected in policy um, and in the public eye uh, in, in so many different ways. Of course, we have, there's an international component which you cannot underestimate the value of the, you know, of trade in our industry. Um, and so I, I can touch on that. Obviously, the United States is, is a big, big part of that. Um, but beyond even just beef, we've got the live cattle and, and even genetics trade as well that we advocate on behalf. I'll get this worked out. So um, I guess very high level to begin with. Um, we'd like to, you know, we're, we're trying to move the dial on attitudes in the, in the beef and cattle production. Constantly, we're seeing um, negative uh, connotations that, you know, in, in large part come uh, from outside of Canada's boundaries uh, and, and migrate in through media and, 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 and just general public perception that, that's negative. And so um, it's, a, it's a constant battle that, um, that we have taken very targeted, strategic approach in, in addressing, and in particular um, in Ottawa, where the policy um, is focused and where decision makers lie, we can, we can focus our, um, our advocacy and our uh, influence in that area to, you know, at the very least, mitigate some of the negative um, consequences of, of bad policy. <clears throat> I'll reference about a year ago, actually, the, <clears throat> the front of pack labeling issue. Now that's one that we, that we came up successful. Unequivocally, it was a big win for us. But why did we have to fight that battle to begin with? It was bad policy, bad regulations that was not grounded in, you know, in common sense. Um, I was very active in that, uh, in that campaign, uh, in meeting with, with policymakers, um, and even talking with, um, with a ton of media. Uh, Glenda Lee is uh, as, uh, in attendance here today. I remember speaking with you about, um, about the issue. Um, and then leading, to, leading with sustainability. So the reason why we have to drive the, you know, that ownership that we have on sustainability is so that we can define what the rules are, what the policy is, and just be absolutely confident that we're defining what that looks like. The previous presentation is obviously very alarming. It's a whole different, um, it's coming at us from a different way than government. Um, and uh, as was referenced, we have been engaged on this issue uh, here for at least a year. Um, of course, we're always looking for improved business risk management solutions, um, and I'm, I'll go into a little bit more detail there. And then um, regulation and policy, uh, you know, what will drive growth in the beef sector in the future are, is low barriers for entry of new packers, um, and, um, and that means actually being competitive with our American, um, our American counterparts. Uh, we are always advocating for increased market access with most recent uh, developments of uh, processed beef into Japan. Um, no, further, no further restrictions on, on that side. And, um, and then uh, most recently, actually, um, access to Taiwan for over 30 months beef. Um, yeah, get, I'll just try to move along here. So, um, moving to, uh, you know, kind of the trade file. I find it, I, it felt like a little bit of a watershed moment 
when we, Canadian Cattle Association, put out a press release that said, uh, we uh, oppose the UK accession to CPTPP. We have been the commodity group, I think, that have been the biggest advocates for trade. But it's got to be fair and open trade. And quite simply, the UK accession to CPTPP uh, was not. Um, it was one-sided. Uh, they, uh, the UK had negotiated bilateral agreements that provided open access directly with Australia and New Zealand, um, but within this agreement, the UK would gain unlo unlimited access to Canada, but we would have restrictions, something in the neighborhood of around just under 3,000 metric tons access to the UK. But that's even beside the point because they've thrown, they, of course, have the other non-tariff barriers that really limit access. And so quite simply, it's our motivation to, um, to uh, uh, block or uh, eliminate the potential of um, a ratification bill that the federal government would bring forward in order to um, press the, our government to work for a fairer deal for beef cattle, uh, for, for the beef industry. Um, so that's kind of been on the front burner here over the course of the last uh, month or two. Uh, another thing on the, on the trade side of things is the voluntary product of USA uh, labeling. Um, it's quite concerning. Um, it harkens back to the mandatory country of origin labeling um, impact where Canada and, the, and Mexico won retaliatory rights in the WTO. Um, it would be our position that if we effectively feel the same effect, the same results as we did with the mandatory country of origin labeling, um, that we would go and initiate again a retaliatory tariff to address what even would be described as voluntary labeling. Now, we've had several conversations with our counterparts in the U.S., the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. They are not proponents of, um, of this rule. And, and so there's details, I think, of, of directions that we can go. Uh, where we sit right now is that we're in the middle of a comment period. The USDA is holding a comment period um, relating to the voluntary rules that would require uh, cattle born, raised, slaughtered, processed, all in the United States in order to carry that label. Now, in the event that packers actually, uh, or anybody within that supply chain um, agreed you know, to do that, it would have pretty significant impacts on the cross-border trade that we rely on, I, that both uh, our American counterparts and, uh, and, and Canadian ranchers rely on. Um, and we can go, you know, we can dive into this in a little bigger detail if you'd want, um, but I'll, I'll just try to keep moving along here. Further uh, on the trade file, um, the Canada-EU trade agreement. Quite simply, it has not lived up to the expectations that we all had. And it seems as though you add another year to the trade agreement and they add another barrier um, to really limit the potential for us to access that market in a wholesome way. Now, there is some beef from Canada moving into the EU uh, following the protocols that are required uh, in order to do that but there's new protectionist measures that are being introduced. One that addresses um, the, it, it's targeted largely, I think, at uh, South America and deforestation. Um, and the concern is that Canada would be forced to, uh, would, would be forced to follow the protocols and report and be able to show that beef that came from a certain place in Canada 
um, did not lead to deforestation. I think we can, in general, um, say that that, there, that that is not widespread. And in fact, in some instances, um, you know, the, the weed that is in my area called the aspen uh, or the, the poplar tree um, is, you know, is, is a bigger issue um, than, you know, in trying to keep it back than it is uh, in trying to support it. But in any case, the concern lies with the requirement to, sh to be able to prove that you're um, not, uh, in, you know, that there's not widespread deforestation associated with the beef that, uh, that is being shipped there. And so really, at the end of the day, it's another barrier to entry into that market. Another side of that would be um, aspects relating to carbon adjustment tariffs. And that's, uh, that opens up a whole nother big um, can of worms um, with respect to free and open trade and barriers to it. I'm um, going to move along here. Uh, Traceability, we are in the comment period, as was referenced earlier, uh, of new traceability regs. Um, quite simply, uh, the, the, regu the new regulations would, um, would require um, movement reporting. And so um, what's really hard to wrap your head around is how, you know, boots on the ground, how does this actually work? Um, so we, we, the Canadian Cattle Association, have actually not yet submitted our official comments to this comment period to, uh, to um, provide our, you know, the perspective. Um, but a counterpoint to the new traceability regulations is that it is part of the picture uh, in preparing and being prepared for an animal disease outbreak. Um, and so quite simply, we need to find a workable solution that actually has value in managing an animal disease event. Um, moving on to the ELDs, uh, quite simply, we are already um, experiencing some bottlenecks <laughs> In, uh, in movement of cattle. Um, and when you layer on more regulations, whether that be uh, the transfer of care documents to the ELD, uh, you know, the, the driver requirements, to, um, to any aspect of this, and you compare it to our American counterparts, quite simply, um, it, we, are, we are finding it difficult to be competitive um, in being able to move cattle uh, to the to the places that they need to efficiently move, um, so that's that's another another issue that we're advocating on behalf of. A, a little bit of a win from the last um, from the last federal budget. There was a line item specifically referencing um, our uh, our ask for a uh, foot and mouth disease vaccine bank. Uh, so what this looks like is a, 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 a dedicated vaccine bank, likely uh, located out of the country, that would um, that could be used in the event of uh, an outbreak in order to manage the outbreak. Um, but it, it it's uh, there's a lot of different kind of scenarios and pathways that you'd follow as to whether or not it would be. Uh, it would be used. Um, I'll, I'll make mention of it right now. This, uh, as I know many of you would, uh, would have known Red Schellenberg, this was one that he felt passionate uh, about achieving. And so I'm very proud to say that, that we were able to, um, to secure that uh, federal funding for this, for the vaccine bank. On the domestic ag side, um, most recently there was a uh, you know the completed sustainable Canadian Ag Partnership SCAP, um, and I, throughout all of it, um, 
if there was one theme that was consistent in, you know, in our circles anyways, is that we were advocating uh, for incentive-based programs. Um, now, there's variation across all provinces, um, and, you know, and I think we're on a spectrum here where there's more and more rep, um, uh, recognition of the, of the importance of cattle on the landscape, and, and I believe we're moving in the right direction, but I still think we've got uh, a, ways, a ways to go. Um, livestock price insurance, um, I think I see that later on the agenda, big advocate for that. Um, quite simply, we'd like to see a, a national program right across the country, make it permanent so that it wasn't dependent on each agricultural policy framework um, five-year stint to get refunded, um, and, and lastly, um, we think that it, to, to be equitable with, with crop farmers, uh, we think that it should have cost-shared cost uh, premiums just as crop insurance does. On the Industry Government Forage Insurance Task Force, that's a bit of a, there's gonna be some references later today as well, I think, to that. I'm really, I'm really optimistic about the, some of the outcomes that have come from, um, from this initiative that's happened on CCA. I, it's been something that I've been directly involved with as well. Um, and, uh, you know, fingers crossed, I, I'm thinking that we can get a tool that is a, a better tool for, uh, for addressing production risk of forage um, across the country. Um, so that was me last week, actually. Uh, I was in Mexico meeting with our Mexican counterparts and, uh, and our American uh, leadership of the NCBA. Um, we hold those meetings um, two or three times a year. It's called the trilateral meetings. Probably more than anything, one issue came up out of that, and that was uh, the concern over Brazilian beef rolling, um, moving in larger quantities into Mexico and uh, the United States. I think they also have access uh, to Canada as well, but I don't think that the volumes uh, have been significant. Um, quite simply, it's a concern because Brazil uh, is not uh, a leader in terms of complying with um, animal health regulations. Uh, quite simply, they had an atypical BSE case, for example, um, that they didn't report for a month. Um, and, and that in Canada and the United States and even Mexico would, would just simply not be acceptable. So how is it that a country that is not complying in that way um, and, you know, and has disease concerns um, has, is gaining access uh, to a, a large part of the North American market and possibly exposing um, our market or our, our countries uh, to, to uh, disease that they wouldn't otherwise be. Keep moving along here. Um, always lots on the environment and climate change file. Um, as you know, as stock growers here are, are every bit as engaged on that file, and a lot of different, um, a, a lot of the same um, projects and initiatives. Um, I'm gonna keep moving. Oh, back to to this one here. So, uh, as part of as part of a. a our campaign um, really to, that, to focus on policymakers and decision makers in Ottawa, we have a multi-pronged approach to, uh, to, to really sway those, that market uh, and, and that, that group of, um, of decision makers. Um, uh, we, we've got um, targeted um, social media campaigns We've got another, uh, we've got one that's called, um, uh, what's it called here? <laughs> I 
I don't want to mangle it here. Get both sides. Get both sides campaign that effectively says, you know, we know that you're seeing negative, uh, negative press and negative points from different sources. Well, here's the counterpoint to this. Um, and, and we've been actually very successful in, in addressing that. The, the Don't Label My Beef campaign um, was kind of a, 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 an integrated portion of that. Um, it, it was an acute issue that we needed to address immediately. Uh, we spent, uh, we had a, a, a good spend in order to, to, to do that targeting. And uh, as a result, actually, it, it turned some heads and it, it changed some minds. Um, and so we're still leveraging the database that was developed from that campaign um, in order to, to advocate for, for, for better policy um, in, in Ottawa in particular. Um, the Guardians of the Grasslands game, I don't know if any of you have seen that. They continue to make um, adjustments or changes so that it's um, the context of the game is appropriate for each province. Um, it just recently, actually, I saw one for Manitoba, um, and uh, one of and so it was it, it was a beta version um, just in in trial, um, but uh, it, it's it's really a, an interesting tool for that should you know that can be used in classrooms to teach kids about the benefits of cattle on the landscape. Really, that's, that's really the, 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 the goal here. And, it, and it's, it's all leveraged on the original movie, uh, Guardians of the Grasslands. Um, just a rundown of quick recent events. Um, so I don't know if if all of you would have would recognize the bill two uh, C two eighty two. This is a a bill that uh, quite simply pits commodities versus other commodities. Um, it is uh, in its essence, it effectively takes supply managed commodities off the negotiating table in the future um, for any future trade negotiation that Canada may have with another country. Quite simply, it's bad policy. Um, it chooses supply management and protects it at the expense of all other commodities that are export oriented. Um, and it's just bad policy. I don't, I don't know who would go into a poker game, for example, showing their opponent two of their cards and saying, okay, let's start betting. Because that's effectively what is happening with Bill 282. If it were to pass, it, were to, it would set the framework for how those negotiations happen before they even sit down. Uh, it's one thing to say, we're not, you know, we're not going to, um, uh, we're not going to negotiate away any more access to our dairy market, it's another thing to say it's not on the table. It, it's in law, not available. So, um, so that's something that we've been working very hard to uh, address, and it's, uh, it's a tough grind. Um, there's a strong lobby that supports it, and, um, and it is, you know, further along than it, it, it has ever been uh, in, in recent in recent years. Um, talked about ELDs and traceability and trade negotiations. Um, sustainable ag strategy. So that, that is something that, that our uh, environment lead, uh, Larry Thomas, has been uh, you know, directly engaged on um, on, a, on a frequent basis. Uh, and, it, and, a, and it obviously is, is him bringing the, the beef cattle perspective to the broader Canadian, you know, sustainability in agriculture um, issue. I think with that, um, I'll open it up for questions um, and, uh, and feedback for that matter. So, uh, 
please um, don't hesitate to, to come up and, and ask a question. Thanks, Tyler, for that uh, overview. Uh, I'm not sure if you can comment on this or not, but I was wondering uh, where the mandatory uh, wholesale beef price reporting uh, is going at the present time. So this has been um, an issue on the, you know, on the file of uh, domestic ag for, it's got to be 10 years. And um, quite simply, uh, we came to the conclusion that Stats Canada could not compel, uh, or Stats Canada was a, a, a dead end. We couldn't go down that route in order to, you know, in order to source the information. So um, the latest is to um, engage directly with uh, really the province of Alberta because it is their jurisdiction um, that would look after it to um, uh, to develop, I guess, uh, a framework to get um, to get the Packers to uh, com comply and and uh, vol and actually voluntarily. Um, submit their wholesale pricing. Um, if you're looking some more details, I've got the best uh, <laughs> the best contact person is here for that file, and that would be Brenna Grant, and she speaks later today. So, okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions here? And if you could mention your name too, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Jeff Yorga. My question is about your lobbying effort in Ottawa. Um, it seems like we've been behind on front of package labeling, on the traceability issues, on business risk management. Do you think that it's a dollar spend issue that we're behind other commodity groups or do you think it's a personnel issue on the ground? I think that there's, um, I think that you're right in that we've we're b behind on some. Uh, I'm not sure I would completely agree on on all of it. For example, the 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 labeling issue. There was a, a timing thing that it. Uh, long story short, I, I I'm not sure we were behind. It it it, it had to be mobilized in a hurry, um, but we had been working on it and and were aware of it um, for three to four years previous. Um, so, uh, there is no doubt we have finite resources, and, um, and those staff members, I think, are very effective, in particular, um, you know, in Ottawa to, you know, to, to influence things. They are very strategic about how we go about, um, advocating for an issue or pushing back on an issue or whatever. But, but quite simply, um, our budget is a tiny fraction of what, of, of what we could possibly spend or what, for example, the dairy lobby has in, in Ottawa. So um, when I sit around the boardroom table, I'm very regularly thinking I'm value for money because, you know, I, I don't think it's in the cards that we're going to see a significant increase in funding uh, uh, of our organization. Uh, and so, quite simply, we just need to make sure that we're spending it in the most targeted and effective way that we can. Um, so, there's always room for improvement there, but... Um, but I think I, I'm very proud of how effective the staff that we have are at, at addressing our issues. And, um, and the other component to that is, is the question of whether or not we should be looking for friends um, 
on joint issues in, in a bigger way. Um, the cattle industry tends to be unique in that we're using a natural environment in ways that other commodity groups aren't. And so sometimes it's a little difficult to find the friends that you need on some issues. Um, but on those issues that we can, you know, that we jointly share, um, for example, trade related issues, uh, canola, pulse, we are typically in lockstep there. And we look for, to leverage those relationships. I Nick, don't know if that, it, if that really helps the, <laughs> the question there, but. I think we have another question here. Your name, please. Hen Henry McCarthy. Um, my question is, to, with the new CCIA tag regu regulations that are coming. Traceability, yep. How have they, have they actually shown a benefit to, say, a disease outbreak investigation by moving to this next level? Like, for example, like we're worried about foot and mouth disease. A calf that goes through Whitewood auction market, and then it, it may get sent to an assembly yard prairie the next day. Could be in Nebraska, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta. And how is having a few of these numbers in a thing, what's that going to change? Like that, I'm a veterinarian, I understand disease outbreak investigation and things like this. It's already, it's over if we ever get to that situation, right? And, yeah, and, so. And, and doing all this, ex keeping all this extraneous information that, it, uh, that I can see as no benefit, you know? And I don't think the tags have maybe opened up too many more markets versus what we had in 2001, you know, and these things. So that's my question as to, because this is gonna add costs to everyone. And uh, what, what is the clear benefit? So uh, I'll, say, I'll say two things. Your points are valid and, um, and, and, and really difficult to, I guess, project forward how, how we come up with uh, a, a workable solution for, you know, boots on the ground um, that actually has value in managing disease outbreaks. Um, I'm, I'm not obviously an expert on this, but I think one would, you know, one could reference the bovine TB outbreaks that we've had over the last 10 years and, and using the, the, those tools um, to, to, to help manage that, those situations. Um, but the, the key thing here, you know, with respect to, in my opinion, with respect to uh, ensuring that we're prepared for foot and mouth disease is having timely movement data. If we don't, if that isn't part of the big plan, it undermines our, every other aspect of the plan, in, in my opinion. But there's got to be, uh, in my opinion, a, a trade-off with a workable solution at the farm. It, it, it can't be onerous. It, it has to be easy. Um, and that is, that's incumbent on, on us as an organization as, and, and provincial organizations such as yourselves um, to, to see if we can figure out where that balance point is. It's not acceptable to me to do nothing to prepare for foot and mouth disease. But it's also not acceptable for me to provide all these layers of new regulations that will effectively um, lead to more guys leaving the business. I, 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 it's at that level that I can comment. I, I think, I, I know it's not, you know, super detailed, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at on things and I think where our board is. Are there any, Are there any more questions or is that, Looks like about it. Oh, one more question. Okay, this will be the last one, and then we have a quick presentation to make. Todd Hudson, JGL, Ustra. Um, the question I have is when 
through these EFT, these e-logs that have come through, was the CCA on that board when they've when they come up with all these rules, or did we have any lobbyists trying to lobby for our cause? Um, so I'm not I'm not super familiar with uh, well I'm not super familiar with uh, exactly what the you know how the regs came in and 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 it it just wasn't my my file kind of thing. Okay. It wasn't I'm not the animal health guy typically. But I can say that, um, that yes, uh, we, you know, advocated right from square one to be in lockstep with effectively the Americans. Um, and, and that is um, effectively have a, a waiver that says if you're hauling cattle, if you're hauling animals, um, that there's... Uh, you know, there's a different set of rules that you can follow here because live cattle, live animals are, are a different scenario. Okay, so I understand that part. But the problem is, is we got lumped under the whole scenario of all truckers. And quite frankly, and I, I mean, we don't have a lot of new Canadians hauling ca uh, cattle around. Yeah. These cattle, we can't even haul cattle from Calvington, Saskatchewan to southern Alberta anymore without an eight-hour rest. So... Where, at what point, does the animal welfare come into effect? And I, so I guess the next question would be, is there somebody lobbying? Are we trying to change the regulations on the e-logs for transportation of livestock? I know the U.S., they're fighting it, and I think they're going to win. So I just wonder where we're at with that. Yeah, no, I, this is not over for us. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe it was... It's probably one of the first, um, the first issues that Nathan Finney, our president, weighed in on directly, um, explicitly saying this is not workable. The ELDs in, in the layer with the whole um, uh, transport regs simply adds these extra bottlenecks that, that make it so that we, we just can't operate anymore. Um, so. You can definitely reference that, and 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 I'll I'll commit right now. This is this is definitely not done as far as we're concerned. Okay, we do have to leave it there. I know you do have a question. I'm sorry, but we do have to we do have to move on here, and we do have a presentation that Garner D. Bull would like to make to you, Tyler Fulton. Tyler Fulton, thank you very much, Vice President of CCA. My apologies for not getting that question, but we do have to move on. Our next presenter of the day is Dr. Melanie Morrison. Now, Melanie's presentation is titled Creating Transparency Around Ranch to Retail Spread. She is the CEO and founder of the technology company BetterCart Analytics, headquartered in Saskatoon. BetterCart Analytics helps industry associations, food and beverage processing companies, CPG manufacturers, and groceries, uh, grocers acquire pricing data so they can better understand their market share and competitive landscape through real-time and historical price records. Right now, Melanie and her team have built the largest independent grocery retail pricing database in Canada, and they will be expanding Better Card Analytics scope of service into the U.S. in 2025. She has an MSc and B a PhD in experimental psychology, an extensive background working with data, advanced quantitative analysis, and behavioral economics. This presentation is brought to you by Golden West Radio. I believe it is a video. I think she's on a cruise ship, I'm told. We have no video. Well, Tyler, if you want to answer that question a little while ago, <laughs> I think we've got some time for a, for a question. We'll try and get Melanie here on the line in just a little bit. But I think we should have a link.
Well, Tyler, if, I guess if you want to come back on up here, we can, uh, we'll get to that question while we, uh, we wait for Melanie Morrison, her ship to come in. Thank you, Tyler. Now, where was that gentleman? I hope he didn't go to the bathroom. Oh, perfect. There we go. Thank you. Uh, and I, I would like to, uh, to thank both, both Todd and Henry for, for their questions. Uh, my comment is, is that in Saskatchewan, we do have both politicians and bureaucrats that understand agriculture in the context of, of Canadian agriculture. In, in, in Ottawa, we have both politicians and bureaucrats that seem to think that they get their understanding of agriculture from Europe, and it's a totally different context. And that's partially why CCA is having this campaign to try to get the policymakers in Ottawa to understand agriculture in the Canadian context. Uh, it, it's an uphill battle to understand agriculture in the Canadian context. Uh, it, it's an uphill battle, uh, but, but we have had some wins, I including the uh, Prime Minister recognizing that we have to do something to, to, to maintain the Canadian grasslands. And that's a small improvement, but we have to keep trying because if we don't, we lose. Uh, the, the bureaucrats that create the electronic log things do not understand that a living cargo that has to you know, sur survive an eight hour rest period is different than a, than a cargo of steel. And uh, yeah, keep on the good work, but it, it's an uphill battle, but if we do nothing, we lose by, by default. I totally agree, Len. Uh, tell you, I, I thought I was off scot-free and then I called back and then Lynn was gonna ask the question. I, I was not, uh, <laughs> not looking forward to that because he, uh, he does not pull any punches at the board table. Um, I, you know, the way I, the way I view um, our role in, in Ottawa is actually as a translator. Um, we try to put, try to put our issues, our perspectives in, uh, in a way, um, that they can understand and grasp, whether it be from a business management standpoint or an environmental standpoint or an animal health, uh, animal, uh, humane treatment standpoint, all of these things, um, are, if you leave them untouched, they take on a life of their own. And uh, if we're not there, then somebody else is writing that narrative that, quite simply, we don't want to be dealing with the consequences of. Was there any other questions? <laughs>